Okay, we'll get started now. So hi everyone. Um, welcome to the Parkinson's Disease 101 webinar with Dr. Wiltshire. My name's Emma. Um, I'm a client service coordinator with the Parkinson Association of Alberta in Calgary, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them in the chat. So you should see it on the right side there for you. Um, and we'll answer them kind of towards the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions throughout, you can add them then. Just as a disclaimer, this webinar will be recorded and all the information provided in the video by the Parkinson Association and the featured speaker is furnished strictly for educational and entertainment purposes only. The service is not intended to be diagnostic, prescriptive or replace the relationship advice and or care of your physician. Any general questions about symptoms, treatments or available medication, complementary and alternative healthcare therapies research will be fielded. Um, so we're joined today by Dr. Wiltshire, and Dr. Wiltshire is a general neurologist practicing out of the South Health Campus and Rocky View Hospital here in Calgary. She has a special interest in treating patients with movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease and complex neurological conditions. So I'll hand it over to you now, Dr. Wiltshire. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Emma, and uh, thanks for having me talk today, and welcome, everybody. Um, strange times, but I'm really happy that we're able to get together virtually if we're not all together in the same room. Um, I think in the future, this will actually open up a, a lot of different options for people connecting in new ways. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the background and basics for Parkinson's disease. We have an hour today. Um, the presentation that I have is about 30 to 40 minutes, um, and then I want to leave time to answer questions at the end. So like Emma said, please put your questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to them. Um, at the end, I think we'll have, have time, um, and I do encourage questions. Um, so I do have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to switch to my screen so that you can see it. It's um, pretty much just to guide the conversation a little bit, um, but mostly it will be me chit-chatting away here. Um, so I am going to try to switch over now to my screen. So Emma, let me know if this doesn't work. Okay, did that work there? So you should be seeing my screen now, um, just the first slide there. So the first thing I'm gonna go through is what is Parkinson's disease? So um, the first couple of slides here are a bit on the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease and then I'm going to get into some of the symptoms and the signs and things people may be experiencing in early Parkinson's disease. I'm really going to focus on early Parkinson's disease um, today. So what is Parkinson's disease? So it's a, it's a neurodegenerative condition. Um, it generally starts in people's 60s, but it really can start anytime. It can start much younger or much later. Um, when we classically talk about Parkinson's disease, we talk about what we call the motor or movement features of Parkinson's disease. But I'm going to talk a little bit throughout this presentation about um, some of the other symptoms that people with Parkinson's disease may experience. So in terms of the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, so there's an area of the brain called the substantia nigra. And in that area, we make something called dopamine. And in Parkinson's disease, the cells that make dopamine, they slowly start to make less and less dopamine. And at a certain point, you start to get symptoms of Parkinson's disease because of a loss of that dopamine. So um, what you see here is a really terrible picture I drew the other night. I'm trying to show some of the circuits for dopamine within the brain. The main one is actually the one that's kind of a kind of a circle there where it goes through something deep in the brain called the uh, basal ganglia. The basal ganglia has a big role in motor programming. So in terms of our movements, making those sort of pre-plans to the movements. Dopamine, though, also has much further reaching, um, it goes much further than just the basal ganglia. So it goes out to the outside of the brain where our actual movements come from, also goes down into the spinal cord, into the rest of our body. 
Then also within that basal ganglia, there are some other neurotransmitters. So there are things like serotonin that are um, connected with mood, um, and there's some other neurotransmitters in there as well. So that's a little bit of just sort of where the dopamine comes from and where the problem is in terms of a lot of those motor features, but some of the other symptoms that people with Parkinson's can get. So one of the pre-questions, one of the questions was, where does this come from? What causes Parkinson's disease? Is this genetic? Um, and some people also ask, is this environmental? Um, and the answer is, for the most part, we don't know. It's not clearly genetic, and usually it's not clearly environmental, although there are um, exceptions to that. So I'm going to guess that some people on the call that can see the slides know who this is. So this is Ozzy Oz. Was born and he's recently come out um, in the media saying that he has one of the rare genetic causes of Parkinsonism so um, Parkin or Park 1 and that that is not common um, but certainly that's possible um, more commonly it's not genetically linked and there's no real clear cause for that So now I'm going to talk a little bit about prognosis, progression, um, and then how clinical care is often set up in, particularly in the urban setting, so in Calgary, but I also think probably in Edmonton, although a disclaimer, I haven't worked in Edmonton since pre-2007, so it may have changed a little bit um, over time, but um, I'll talk about how the clinical care is set up here in, um, in Calgary. Um, so, in terms of progression, it's incredibly variable. So it's a really difficult question in some ways to answer. I have people that I've followed in my practice for nearly a decade, and they are treated on medication, but Parkinson's and the symptoms of Parkinson's are unlikely to ever affect the quality of their life. The progression is so slow, they can treat it with a the medication, they're responding really well to the medication, they're able to do all the things that they want to do in life, um, despite having Parkinson's disease. And so I certainly have a group of people that I follow in my clinic for that, because we do still need to adjust their medication so that they continue to do those things they want to do in life. And medication needs, which I'll talk about later, um, do go up over time. And and that's okay because we can increase those as needed and they can continue to do things like um, exercise and, and do the things that they enjoy. Then I also do have people in my practice that um, come and, and have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and within a couple of years need some subspecialty expertise care. Um, there are some predictive factors, so things like having a tremor at onset um, is, is one factor that might indicate a bit of a slower progression over time, but I certainly have people that don't fall within that sort of predictive factor rule. So um, it's predictive, it's not absolute. Um, so over time though, is that progression over time is really predictive of how fast that progression will be in the future a lot of the times. Um, so we have to wait and see. In Calgary, the way that the clinical care is set up is that most people with Parkinson's disease can be very well treated by a general neurologist like myself. Um, some people though, if they say have quite rapid progression or there's some uncertainty about that diagnosis, then they require the next level care of uh, a movement disorder specialist. And so here in Calgary, there's a movement disorders clinic. I know there's also the movement disorders clinic in Edmonton. Um, so they have extra training. So all general neurologists are very well trained. We get a lot of exposure um, to Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease in our training. Um, but the movement disorder specialists have extra training even on top of that. They have access to some of the subspecialty treatments that, in general, most people with Parkinson's disease never need, um, but certainly some people do need them over, over time. And when that's the case or when those things are being considered, um, then 
a referral gets me to the subspecialty clinic, the movement disorders clinic. So most people, particularly early in Parkinson's disease, will be followed by a general neurologist with only a referral to that movement disorders clinic um, if needed or if indicated. So that's a bit how we're set up here in Calgary. Um, the other thing I'll add to that is that I'm going to talk a little bit about exercise um, in a few slides here and both the Movement Disorders Clinic and all general neurologists have access to the same physiotherapy programs for that exercise piece um, and allied health services. So um, you can access that no matter which clinic you're a part of. So now I'm just going to move into a bit of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. You may have heard or read about the mnemonic TRAP, um, T-R-A-P. So the first three letters of that are really what's relevant to early Parkinson's disease or people that are um, perhaps just being given a diagnosis. So the diagnosis might be considered. Um, so the first one is a tremor and the tremor of Parkinson's disease is different than the tremor of what's much more common, which is essential tremor. So with Parkinson's disease, people have tremor when they're resting. So they might be sitting, watching TV, they might be walking and their arms are at rest and then that tremor comes out. When they go to move, particularly early in Parkinson's disease, that tremor often disappears, at least for a bit until they um, hold a new position. So that is in contrast to what's much more common in the population, which is essential tremor. An essential tremor um, is really common and it, it's an action tremor. So unlike the Parkinson's disease tremor, which is present when you're resting, an action tremor is not present when you're resting and then you go to reach for something or bring a cup to your mouth or a spoon and you shake. Um, so that's an action tremor. So that's in contrast to the tremor of someone that has Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. The next one, the next uh, letter in the mnemonic is R and that stands for rigidity. And what that is, is it's a stiffness. And that is a special type of stiffness that people with Parkinsonism um, can get. Um, so when you go to see your neurologist, they feel your tone or sort of move your arms around and what they're feeling for is evidence of that stiffness that goes along with Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. The A stands for akinesia, but really what we're talking about is bradykinesia, which is a slowness of movement. So brady for slowness and kinesia for movement. This can manifest as things like taking a long time to do up buttons or shoelaces. Um, if someone's writing when they have Parkinson's, their writing can get quite small um, as they go along the line. That's part of that slowness of movement too. So when you go to see your doctor, they'll make you do some quick movements, see how quick they are um, to see if there's a slowness there. Some people most commonly actually with Parkinson's will have a slower side on one side and a um, one side that's less affected so it moves quicker. So it's usually asymmetric. The P for the trap is actually something that early Parkinson's doesn't generally affect and that's postural instability. So balance is affected but not early. Um, so that's more of a late uh, symptom for Parkinson's disease. I'm going to move on to treatments for Parkinson's disease. In a couple of slides, I will get into the Parkinson's plus syndromes and some other causes for the symptoms that I just described um, that aren't necessarily Parkinson's disease. So I will talk about those a bit, but right now I'm going to talk about treatments for Parkinson's disease. Um, so the first one I have on here is exercise. So we know that people with Parkinson's disease, if they get active and they exercise now um, or when, when they're early in the course of Parkinson's disease, they will do better years down the road. Um, so if we look at how they're functioning years down the road, if they've been active now and they start to engage in physical activity, then they will have better outcome scores years from now. So we say exercise. Um, in terms of talking about what type of exercise, 
the studies, a lot of the studies were done using the LSVT BIG program. So that stands for Lee Silverman Voice Therapy Program, BIG program. Um, sorry, I put an extra program in there, but LSVT BIG program. And so what the studies have looked at is people engaging in this program, how they do down the road compared to people that don't engage in the program. Um, so most of the research is done on that activity specifically. Um, so we promote it, um, but there's also research showing that really any safe physical activity is going to improve outcome down the road. Um, so we promote getting active with physical activity early and safely. Um, and if you have access and are appropriate for the LSVT big program, then we promote that program um, as the go-to one. And if anyone has any questions about that further, I can definitely talk about it um, a little bit more at the end of the at the end of the presentation here. The other main treatment is medications, and the first line therapy is something called Cinemet. Um, that's what we use here in Canada, and what it stands for is levodopa, levodopa carbidopa. And so, essentially, what Cinemet is is it's dopamine in a form that can get into the brain. So, carbidopa, so of that levodopa. Carbidopa. Um, carbidopa stops levodopa from being turned into dopamine in the rest of your body, whereas levodopa goes into the brain. Once levodopa is in the brain, there's a chemical there that can make it go from levodopa to dopamine. So cinemat is essentially dopamine in a form that gets it into the brain. We used to use dopamine agonists more. So for example, something called Mirapex or Pramipexel. Um, we don't use that nearly as much anymore. Um, and some of us rarely um, use it, if ever, um, now because of issues with impulse control disorders. So in particular, things like gambling, sex addictions, online shopping, um, we know that the prevalence of that as a side effect of dopamine agonist is really high. Um, it can happen with cinnamon, but it's, it's not nearly as common as with the dopamine agonist. So I'm going to move a little bit to talk about side effects. There was a pre-question that came in about um, protein. Um, so I am going to address diet later at the end of the presentation here, but I will right now just um, directly address the question about the protein, um, as well as some of the other side effects. So Cinemet does have some side effects. Um, the main one when someone's starting the medication is that we see is nausea. So most people will get a titration schedule, um, which means you will get a dose that's really quite low that you take for say three or seven days and then you go up and then you go up and then you go up until you find the dose that you need to control your symptoms. That's because if we started at full dose, most people will feel really quite sick. By doing that slow schedule up to get to the target dose, it avoids it's nausea for most people. If people still have nausea, then there are medications that we can give to safely help with that. But ideally, we don't. The other side effect that we see is that Cinemet can worsen something called orthostatic hypotension. So when someone goes to stand up, they can feel quite dizzy if their blood pressure drops. Cinemet can worsen that, so we need to watch for that. Um, that's another um, fairly common side effect tends to be more later in the course of Parkinson's as opposed to early on. If someone has issues with hallucinations, for example, um, again, later in the course of Parkinson's, um, cinnamon and dopamine can make that worse. Um, so something that we watch for. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about protein because that was a specific question. My view of this is one that is not always shared. I certainly, so you're going to hear different things about this from different neurologists, and I don't think anyone's right. Um, so the science behind the protein thing is that we know that if you take cinnamon at the same time as protein, it can impair, uh, impair absorption. Um, so you don't always get the same amount of the cinnamon being absorbed in your stomach if you have protein in there. Um, my take on this is that early in Parkinson's, most people are adjusting to taking a medication three times a day because that's how it's usually prescribed. 
sometimes four times a day, but usually at the start, three times per day. And that's tough. It's, it's hard with lifestyle to remember to take the medication, to get into a pattern of taking the medication. So I commonly prescribe the medication at the start of Parkinson's disease to be taken with meals because that's what most people have as a schedule of a three times per day. That gets people into the habit of taking the medication and it's easier to um, be able to remember to take it and to sort of get into that pattern. If we start to see that sometimes people are not responding to the medication or as Parkinson's disease progresses, being sure that we get the exact amount in each time becomes more um, relevant. So we start to look at things like separating it out from meals. But I certainly don't suggest that early in the course unless it becomes an issue. Um, but different neurologists have, have differing views on that. Um, and I think it depends on the person um, and their ability to remember to take medications and what works for their lifestyle. So that's my, my take on the, the protein piece. Now, I have this slide up here for complications as opposed to side effects because what happens with Parkinson's disease is that early in the disease, and this is part to do with the slide before as well with the discussion with the protein, is that the cells that make dopamine, although they're making a lot less dopamine, they're still making dopamine. As Parkinson's disease progresses, whether you're on medication or not, those cells make less and less dopamine. Um, so part of the progression of Parkinson's disease is that you need to give more dopamine into the brain to be able to function the way that you have in the past. And one of the things that's often listed as a side effect that I would say is actually more a complication of Parkinson's is that over time you need increasing doses. Whether you start Cinemet early or late, it, it doesn't matter in the long run. You're still going to need that extra dose as you get further along in Parkinson's disease. Um, so increasing dosage over time is not a side effect of the medication. It's a complication of, of Parkinson's. Um, the other one I'll put here, and I have a picture up here of Michael J. Fox. Um, he, er, so this was a number of years ago, but he, he, he did a famous interview one time and he was having quite a bit of extra movements and someone accused him of not taking his medications um, to try to have more symptoms during the interview. And actually it was the opposite. Um, so there's something called dyskinesia. So 50% of people within five years of treatment with Cinemet will get some extra movements. They are sort of smooth, rhythmic dancing type movements. And those are dyskinesias. Um, and it's a, it's a part of the treatment, but it's a part of finding that balance of how much dopamine do you need to be loose and be able to do all the things you want to do um, and not be stiff um, and, and sort of finding where that balance is. And over time, as you have fewer, uh, less dopamine being made in the brain, the ability to find that balance becomes trickier. So when you're higher in, in the amount of dopamine that you have, you get these extra movements. When you're lower, you get very stiff and uncomfortable. Um, so it's trying to find that balance. So I've put that as a separate slide because it's more of a sort of complication of the progression of Parkinson's as opposed to uh, just an isolated side effect of the medication. So I'm going to talk now about some of the symptoms we don't always talk about as much. Um, for Parkinson's, and that's the non-motor symptoms. So I have a picture up here of um, my baby um, because sleep is affected, and my that's my baby who looks like he's sleeping really well, but over the last few weeks, this would not be an accurate portrayal of his sleep pattern. Um, so he's been up all the time. Um, so people with Parkinson's have quite a bit of sleep difficulty often. It's a really common one. Um, one, of the, one of the sleep issues that people with Parkinson's can get that is much more common in Parkinson's and Parkinsonism than um, the general population is something called REM sleep behavior disorder. So when we go to sleep, 
we go into a stage of sleep called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. And what that is, is when we are dreaming, our eyes can move, but the rest of our body cannot move. Our brain turns off the ability for the rest of the body to move. In REM sleep behavior disorder, that turning off of the rest of the body doesn't always work. Um, so if someone has a dream, they act out their dreams. Um, and so that's an important question that we ask for all people that come in with Parkinson's is whether they're acting out their dreams in sleep because it can be dangerous for both them and their bed partner and there's good treatments for that. Um, so it's important to talk to your neurologist about that. The other picture I have up here is to represent depression. Oh, sorry, actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the other sleep difficulties um, that people with Parkinson's can get. So um, sleep trouble and insomnia is incredibly common and it increases with age. Um, so difficulties with either going to sleep or maintaining sleep or early morning wakening. There's no quick fix for that. There's no one medication that you can take. Um, we use the same approaches for that for people with Parkinson's as anyone else with insomnia. And that tends, um, tends to be mostly behavior modifications. Um, so things like not drinking fluids um, late in the day, um, exercising every morning, making sure you have a regular sleep schedule, not napping much during the day, those sorts of things. Something that you can talk to your family physician about and get some tips for. There is an app if you have a smartphone um, called the Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia app, CBTI. Um, some good feedback on that. It goes over some of those things I mentioned, some things that you can look and see whether you're doing or not doing. So things like screen time late in the day, um, it goes over all those things. So something to think about if you are that one of the people that like technology. Um, depression is the next one I had on here to touch on. Um, so depression, again, incredibly common in the general population and even more common in Parkinson's disease. It can actually precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. The Neurotransmitter serotonin is often involved in depression and we know that it can be affected um, by Parkinson's disease. So often medications are used to help normalize and, um, those neurotransmitter levels, um, but also approaches of talking. Um, it's important to mention if you're feeling depressed or um, having anxiety as well. That's another thing we can see um, more commonly in people with Parkinson's disease because um, there are some treatments for that that can be very helpful. Constipation is another one that's very common in Parkinson's disease. Again, tends to predate the diagnosis. Not everyone gets it, but vast majority do. Lots of treatment options for that in a graduated approach. Please talk to your family physician um, or your neurologist to get some information about that and how to treat it. Because um, the impact on quality of life for people for constipation is actually a lot more than what you might think. So if you're experiencing that, you're not alone. Um, and there's lots that we can do to help you for that. Cognitive decline is another um, common non-motor symptom. Cognitive decline is not common early in Parkinson's disease. So if someone is having cognitive decline or difficulties with their memory before they get diagnosed or within the first year of diagnosis, then it really makes us think about, you know, what's causing the symptoms. Is this Parkinson's disease or is this another cause for those symptoms? Um, that leads me to the next slide, which is talking about Parkinson's plus syndromes and other causes of Parkinson's disease. So when we talk about Parkinsonism versus Parkinson's disease, the term Parkinsonism is the umbrella term that we use. So when you talk about a headache, you say the word headache, but there's a lot of things that can cause a headache. You can hit your head on the table. You can have a migraine. Um, you can be hungover. Uh, lots of different things can give you a headache, and we just use the term headache for that. So Parkinsonism is the term that we use for anyone with those symptoms that I described within that mnemonic, that trap mnemonic, so tremor, um, stiffness, rigidity, akinesia, bradykinesia, and that postural instability. There's a group of um, diagnoses that can cause Parkinsonism, but they have other symptoms. So we call them Parkinson's plus syndromes. So it's Parkinsonism plus some other symptoms. So a few of the common ones that you may have heard of are things like multiple system atrophy, uh, cortical basal syndrome, progressive supranuclear palsy, or dementia with Lewy bodies. And I say common, um, common within the Parkinsonism 
um, description, but they're not common. They're actually really quite rare in society as a whole. Um, but within Parkinson's and other causes of Parkinson, Parkinsonism, they are, they are common there. There are some other causes of uh, Parkinson's symptoms. So someone can have um, a number of small strokes or a large stroke that can cause it. They present quite differently. So on clinical history, your neurologist usually can help to sort of tease out um, what the cause is. There are some street drugs that can do it that people inject into themselves. Um, so so there's, there are some other causes for Parkinsonism. When someone has Parkinson's symptoms, we always keep our eyes open um, and see people over time to see whether they develop symptoms that make us think that actually maybe it's not Parkinson's disease. Maybe it's a Parkinson's plus syndrome because we can be wrong um, and we won't always know that until down the road and that can be years down the road. So we continuously ask screening questions to see if there's red flags for the symptoms not being from Parkinson's disease but being from something else. Um, and then we address that if we're starting to see that. The reason it's important is that with Parkinson's plus syndromes, there tends to be a faster course. So though again, it's really variable, uh, but overall people tend to have a faster course. Cinemet, initially for some people with a Parkinson's plus syndrome can be quite effective for their motor symptoms, which is where that sort of diagnostic dilemma can come in, but it doesn't tend to last. So the response to the medication doesn't tend to be full like it is with Parkinson's disease. Um, it doesn't tend to last over time. Usually when we start people with early Parkinson's disease on Cinemet, they really go back to their baseline level of function. They can do what they wanna do. They can engage in the activities they are engaging in. Um, with Parkinson's plus, it doesn't tend to be like that. They don't tend to get quite as dramatic of a response and it doesn't last as long. Um, so that's why we keep an eye out for that. The treatments though really are the same. So it's treating with the dopamine with the Cinemet um, as well as the physiotherapy and then treating all the other symptoms that go along with it as they come up for what's important for each person. So that's a bit of what I was going to talk about. We did get some pre-questions that didn't really sort of fit into what I've talked about. So I'm just going to address those now. Um, so someone asked a question about alcohol and Parkinson's disease as well as some medication interactions. So this is, um, this is my little guy here again uh, with, a, with a draft beer there. But um, so alcohol itself does not specifically interact with Cinemet, um, but some of the things that alcohol can do can really compound symptoms of Parkinson's disease as well as some side effects of the medication. So long-term heavy alcohol use can cause difficulties with balance, um, difficulties with things like feeling your feet, so it can cause something called a peripheral neuropathy. Add that to Parkinson's disease, which over time can affect postural instability, and you have a combination that can lead to increased falls um, and disability. Alcohol can also cause difficulties with orthostatic hypotension, so dropping blood pressure on standing. And we know that both Parkinson's disease and the medication used to treat it can do that as well. So that's, those two things can compound um, and it can become worse. Additionally, alcohol, particularly heavy alcohol usage over time can cause worsening memory. And again, Parkinson's disease can also do that over time. Um, so we want to limit consumption of alcohol is usually my recommendation. Um, you can either stop it or at least just limit it so that you are sort of going by those same guidelines that we would have for heart health. Um, medication interactions was another question that people had. So Cinemet doesn't tend to interact with much of any medication. It's usually very safe. Things like blood pressure medications can worsen things like orthostatic hypotension when you're standing up and dropping blood pressure. So those things need to be watched. Um, but really important is that when you're on a medication, when you're on Cinemet, it's really important to not abruptly stop it. That can be dangerous and even life-threatening. Um, so if you're thinking of coming off of the medication or um, doing some adjustments and things, it's really important to talk to your doctor about that. Um, but usually medication, so Cinemet's not going to interact with most other medications. 
There was a question about diet. So we recommend the Mediterranean diet, and that's because there's some data on the Mediterranean diet being protective for brain health, for memory. Um, and so really that's the only diet we have data on, on it having any real beneficial effects. But most importantly is that you don't get nutritionally deplete, that you have a balanced diet, that you don't wind up with something like a B12 deficiency where it affects balance and memory and things. Um, so you want to make sure that you keep a balanced diet um, as the most important thing. But if you're looking for a diet to follow, then the Mediterranean diet is the only one that we have um, data on it being beneficial. Um, that protein piece comes in to diet as well, and I, I sort of mentioned that. So early in Parkinson's, we don't, I don't suggest worrying about it at all unless it becomes an issue of um, not getting um, predictable response from your medication. Someone asked about caring for someone with Parkinson's disease. So early in Parkinson's disease, with proper treatment, people usually do really well. Um, they're able to continue with a lot of the activities that they want to continue with. Uh, maybe some modifications to make sure it's safe. Um, but overall, the function is, is really, really good. Um, so part of caring for someone with Parkinson's disease, some things that you can do early in Parkinson's disease is get active with those people. Um, if you're living with them and cooking with them, um, you know, getting, getting in it together because there's nothing wrong with um, having a healthy, active lifestyle, uh, whether you have Parkinson's disease or not. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I do think it's really important not for just people with Parkinson's disease, but for people with Parkinson's disease and their partners and everyone else in their family to have personal directives and discussions about goals of care. Um, everyone should have this documented at home um, and with them in case something were to happen. Um, so that's another thing that you can do in terms of discussing with the people that you love um, so that you know what their wishes would be and making sure that that have a lot of tools to help with that. Um, so please discuss that with your family doctor. As Parkinson's disease progresses, then there are definitely other things that um, caregivers will want to have information about. And there's lots of information available. Um, through both Alberta Health Services, uh, groups like Parkinson's Alberta, um, to help guide that. You can help people, you can help your um, partner or the person you're caring for or um, living with who has Parkinson's to do things like apply for a parking placard if mobility starts to become an issue. Um, there's a lot of paperwork associated with all of these things, so helping them through the processes um, can be quite helpful. I think most importantly is taking care of yourself. Um, so you can't really care for someone well unless you're taking care of your own physical and mental health too, so um, working on some healthy strategies for, for that. Um, so this is um, the last sort of slides here are really on resources available to support people with Parkinson's disease. So your family physician is available to you. If you're worried about calling your family physician right now for any health concerns, don't be. Um, they're there. Um, most of them are not super busy right now. Um, so they can either talk to you on the phone or by video. Most of us neurologists are also calling all of our patients by phone or talking to them about any of their concerns. There's a lot of mental health supports available, so um, you can text in a text for hope um, to AHS and you can get a, um, a mental sort of health wellness uh, text each day if you do that and sign up to that service. Um, there are resources available on My Health Alberta um, for some tips and tricks if you're having troubles with your mental health, but I do encourage you to talk to your family doctor. Access mental health distress line, not Ling, uh, line there. Um, so definitely call them if you're um, experiencing any acute distress. Um, in Edmonton, one of the primary care networks has a senior center without walls, um, but it's available to any uh, resident of Alberta and it's meant to be for resources for people that have difficulty getting out of their homes for supports. Um, so the phone number is there on the screen. You can call them. They can mail you a brochure. It's also available online if you happen to be online, but it, you don't need to be online. You can just call the number that's there and they can let you know about their programs. Um, I've heard that it's an excellent program and you don't need to be in Edmonton for that. And it was available pre-COVID. Um, so they're well, well into how to do that in a way that supports people. Um, 
Parkinson's Canada has some information and various supports, um, and then Parkinson's Alberta. And I think Emma can probably comment a lot more on some of the um, weekly supports that they have available as well. Um, so that is all I had to talk about today. So it leaves us with about 20 minutes for questions, comments. Yeah, so thank you. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions yet. Um, but I will just mention, yeah, the Parkinson Association of Alberta is here to support people with Parkinson's or anybody affected by Parkinson's disease. Um, we have support groups across the province. Um, I know here in Calgary we do 12 and they have all been moved to online telephone support groups. We've got different webinars every Wednesday, so um, like this one today and then there's one next week as well. We have exercise classes on Monday, so we're um, trying to offer something for everybody. So there's lots out there. Um, and I'm just checking the chat again and it, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Looks like you covered it all. I hope I didn't just bore people so they <laughs> stopped listening. So <laughs> um, if you do have any questions though for me, um, you can definitely, uh, Emma knows how to get a hold of me, but um, yeah. I do encourage you to talk to your neurologist as well as your, uh, your family doctor for any questions that you might have. Yeah, and it's definitely good to know that you can reach out to your family doctor and your neurologist and they're available virtually. So if you are having a concern, you can reach out to them and they'll be able to chat with you. Yeah, so um, it doesn't look like there's any questions, so maybe we'll wrap up here. Thank you, Dr. Wiltshire, for being able to join us today and sharing your knowledge on Parkinson's disease. We really appreciate your time and you doing this for us. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Our next webinar will be next Wednesday, April 29th, and it's about Parkinson's medication. So if you want to join that one, you can register the same way you did for this one. And then any information that you need, please visit our website, parkinsonassociation.ca, or follow us on social media. We're posting a bunch on there, and you can see what's going on with us. And all of our webinars will be shared on our YouTube channel as well, so you can always view them afterwards. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.